sorry to come, you know, about hope with a difficult message or something, but it's really hard work to be hopeful in this sense. Uh, thank you all for the invitation and for being here. Really welcome this opportunity and, and welcome you all to Boulder, to the rainy Boulder that we have. Um, and I want to just appreciate that we have this bridge building theme here. Um, I really love that. I feel like a, a bridge builder and walker myself in my life. As you just heard, I've been in all kinds of uh, strange places, uh, from the most scholarly to the very applied. Um, and what I want to share with you this morning actually uh, comes out of that intersection of going back and forth between the world of practice and scholarship. And uh, one of the big themes that uh, keeps coming up in my work increasingly, you've heard I mostly work on climate change and, you know, of course here we have a much broader set of issues, but whether you're interested in, I don't know, from fracking to food security to, you know, species extinctions to the garbage patch in the Pacific Ocean, you all will have probably encountered the challenge of how to stay hopeful and all our audiences have that particular challenge. So I want to um, think with you together um, about this topic of hope um, and how that in and of itself is a kind of a bridge, but not an easy one, not, not one that gives you a lot of things to hold on to. So I want to uh, do that and, and just see if, you know, this is work that is just sort of uh, emerging. Um, in terms of uh, w having written about it, not yet. I am uh, right now writing um, with Carol Berzonski, uh, who's a graduate student in psychology, uh, about this as we speak. Um, but really, as I said, uh, it's come out of the many, many conversations I've had with people who I train or people who I work with in the world of uh, you know, practice, policy, management, um, who are just struggling with how to keep their their hope up in, in this particular point in time. So, raises the question, you know, what are we talking about? Why do we even need hope? <laughs> um, and particularly maybe at this time, is there something, um, you know, if, if we have enough hope, um, then maybe even if it's a difficult time, maybe we're fine. But so is there actually a problem with hope in particular in this country? And I invite you um, to think about that wherever you come from. And how do we think about hope? What is that? Um, and the, I want to spend most of my time really about how do we foster it within ourselves and within other people with whom we might communicate in one way or another. Um, and then just simply close with a, which I really want to leave more as a question than anything is what is it that we hope for? So this is you know, roughly uh, some questions one might ask about this topic, but it's also um, the outline for my talk. So let me just begin here with the question of why bother? Why do we need hope? You might think, duh. Well, this is where we are right now, isn't it? This is the kind of things that we see at all times, whether we look outside the window, you know, I've been, ever since I've come to Boulder, I've ha heard nothing but how extreme the rainfall has been. I come from California where we wish we had some. Um, you know, it's, it's extremes all over. It's, you know, demonstrations now finally in the street uh, about the climate crisis. We have people telling us um, it's too late, Requiem for a Species. Um, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And other folks, you know, telling us it's the end of things, right? It's a, it's a sort of apocalyptic moment. That is both in the cultural sense, but also in, in nature and in our environment, what we encounter on a daily basis. And in fact, um, if you think about it, these are images of things really happening already. You might say, well, it's not just a matter of, you know, just talking about it or whatever, it's here. The apocalypse has arrived. Uh, interestingly enough, um, I just, I don't know if you uh, noticed that or heard that, uh, when the IPCC released its most recent assessment, one of the contributing authors, Richard Toll, uh, talk about, you know, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So we're now using this language um, everywhere. 
And then you look outside and it's actually lo lovely weather, weather. It's, you know, you have a great day. Your kids are, you know, in front of you and it's all lovely. So, wow, what a tension between, you know, those experiences that we have. And then there's this issue that it's kind of sometimes hard to distinguish between what is real and what is sort of coming out of the imaginative. What I put up here are just, um, I thought, strikingly similar pictures. One is a famous painting, the other one is the real tsunami that uh, hit Japan a couple of years ago. I mean, it's almost identical. And I, I, sometimes I wonder if people can still distinguish between what is on TV and what will go away and it's all made up versus what is actually real. But those who know the most about the sciences um, are actually quite um, honest about how difficult they find it. I don't know if you've noticed in recent, uh, just the last couple of years, there have been initiatives um, where scientists in particular speak about their emotional responses to whatever topics they study. I find that a really pheno interesting phenomenon. We did not get that, you know, that scientists would speak about their emotions. I mean, that was, it's like taboo. <laughs> we don't talk about that, right? It is, we just study things and we don't have any emotion about it. And then the rest of it is very private. Well, now apparently those who know most about it are coming forward and say, you know, this does touch me. Um, and in fact, I just put up three pictures here, a couple of friends that, um, who um, have spoken to me directly um, about it. Diana Liverman, some of you may know, a geographer who said sometimes she would just love to shut the office and just go back to work and not think about it, not feel it, what she's actually working on. Bill Hook, a meteorologist, um, who, you know, really says, I can only get through this with uh, a lot of spiritual sort of support through his uh, belief. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's basically how he manages to stay with it. Uh, Joni Klepis, who is a, a research scientist here uh, at NCAR, works on coral reefs, um, has been deeply, deeply affected by what she studies and has shared that with me. And I write about it in, in a chapter, book chapter, uh, called Getting Real About It. I won't say that in public, what she said, but um, it's uh, worth reading. She had a very visceral response to that. Anyway, so I just leave it at that. And then the last thing that I want to say about this moment in time um, that frames sort of this discussion on hope is that it's actually really hard to imagine. This is from a, the picture here in the quote uh, by Margaret Atwood is from an initiative um, at ASU, Arizona State University, where it's, you know, she basically articulates that with climate change, everything is changing. And, and some of it is not actually climate related, but of course they all interact and it's incredibly difficult to imagine what that would look like. Um, when I found this particular quote, I was reminded of this poem um, by Jane Hirschfeld. Maybe some of you know it. She says, when this ship first came to Australia, Cook wrote, the natives continued fishing without looking up, unable, it seems, to fear what was too large to be comprehended. I think that is sometimes what we're, uh, what we're encountering. And f interestingly, this poem is called Global Warming. This is what we face, that we are faced with something that is overwhelmingly big, and we have a really hard time figuring out how to deal with that. And to address it, and I just want to put this out here as, you know, I, I feel compelled to have two scientific graphs or something in this uh, uh, presentation, so I'm going to put this up for you to kind of get into this space yourself. What you see here are projections of how climate might change under different uh, you know, emission scenarios that the IPCC uses. They're called RCPs, or Representative uh, Concentration Pathways. Um, and basically what you see here is, you know, if we were to actually stick to this sort of uh, consensus, not quite consensus anymore, uh, idea of we should keep the warming to two degrees or less by the uh, over pre-industrial levels by the end of this century, um, we ought to go on this uh, lowest scenario that you see here in blue at the bottom. What's really interesting for me about this is that, you know, so it's 2015, and what you see here is that this particular curve starts bending down, peaking at 2020, and then going down. Now, what do we need to achieve? I think that's important to 
grasp. What the IPCC in its most recent assessment said is if we want to have a greater than 66% chance, a better than two out of three chance of hitting that particular target of staying around two degrees, then we need to aim for concentrations in the atmosphere of all greenhouse gases combined of 450 parts per million. Now, to get there, it would mean that by the middle of the century, we have reduced our global emissions by 40 to 70 percent, and by the end of the century, we're near zero or below. What that means is to basically suck it out of the atmosphere. 40 to 70 in the next 30 years, and then to nothing by the end of the century. That challenge is really, really huge. And I want to put this to you in another term, and that is this one. What do we actually know right now about what countries are willing to do? What this here shows, um, again, these uh, green and yellow uh, scenarios at the bottom that re represents those staying below, below two degrees, that is the pathway um, that we hopefully ought to go on. Um, what we currently are on with the kinds of things that are already on the books, not like you know doing nothing. We obviously are already doing something, but what we're on right now is that blue one um, that you see there um, in the upper middle or whatever. Um, and if you look at what are the pledges that are now coming in, slowly trickling in for the Paris conference uh, in December, um, that is the red line. And if we were to all ignore that and you know uh, develop all the tar sands, use all the dirty coal, all the dirty fuels, then we would end up with the gray scenario. So that's basically what you know the, what the scenarios are. Um, so we're on the blue one. That gets us to about 3.6 to 4.2 degrees centigrade. And I just want to sort of uh, tell you about a British. Um, climatologist by the name of Kevin Anderson, who said around four degrees is when we are at a situation when a coherent functional civilization is no longer sinkable. It just doesn't work anymore. We don't have the food, we don't have the transportation, we don't have the energy to get us to be a coherent society, civilization. But that's the one we're on right now. And where we need to go is the green or the yellow one. So that's the challenge. Some of you probably have heard this particular uh, TED Talk. If you haven't, I highly recommend it by David Roberts, who used to be until recently a grist blogger, who gave a, a great talk um, to ex make this very clear and, and convincing, if you will. Um, and at, near the end of his talk, he said, you know, this is where we're, we, where we're at right now. We're stuck between the impossible and the unsinkable. We can't find our way seemingly to the yellow-green scenarios. We're stuck on the one that is bound to destroy us. And so he didn't actually end his talk there. I just want to make clear that you know. It ended on this note. And so for the rest of your life, your job is to make the impossible possible. That's the challenge that he put before us. And that is, I mean, that's, if you will, the essence of how to find hope. How do you find hope in that moment when you're stuck between the impossible and the unthinkable and that's what you need to do? How do you keep going when things will, even if we do everything we possibly can, it won't be a pretty world. So how do you keep going? Well, and then you just add you know, more species extinctions or whatever the next bad news is that you, that you find. So this is, this is the barrage that people find themselves in. So why do we need hope? I think it's basically to keep going in the face of this. Um, most of us think of it just in that term, in the sense of we just need to cope, we need to keep going, we need to do our best. I think hope asks us actually to do that impossible, to do, make the impossible possible. Um, and in some ways, I think that is living a life of integrity, something that is far, we, we all need to rise to a higher level um, than any of us have risen to date. Um, and I think ultimately in the face of this kind of danger that we're facing, um, it is a, a call, a desire to affirm hope and to affirm life in, uh, in the face of death or despite death. So do we have that kind of hope? Let's see. 
I'm going to actually draw on something that Ed, Ed may be talking about. Um, so Ed Maybach is here. He has been working with Tony Lazarowitz, as you, many of you know, on the Six Americas uh, audience segmentation studies, tracking how Americans feel and think about uh, global warming for a long time. Um, I'm going to use uh, about three slides from, from their work um, just to give you a sense of where the American public is and then broaden that out to, to beyond that. So this is one of the, uh, the slides that they have produced um, over time looking at how much do Americans actually worry about this topic. I mean, you know, the hope, as, you, as I just said, you need to somehow recognize how big the problem is and then you need to see whether or not you have it in you to work in the face of that. So this is what um, we know. Um, about half or so of the American public worries, but not particularly strongly. It's, as we know, not top of mind uh, material for many. But, you know, there is some recognition of danger. Interestingly, most of that hope actually, or most of that worry happens on uh, the left-hand side of the, the segments. What that means is the most alarmed, the most concerned about this also obviously have the greatest worry. So this isn't particularly su su surprising, um, but you get an idea that this is not evenly spread across the population, this worry. Now, this is just the worry side. Now, as we know, um, this is, you know, a very old finding, not particular to climate change, but it is certainly um, one that we're all familiar with. If you are faced with a very great danger and you have no effective response to deal with it, it is practically unbearable, right? So that is the thing, the com combination of big danger with no effective response that makes us go numb, that makes us go apathetic, helpless, and despairing. So. How do Americans think about the response side? What's interesting here, I want to point this out, there's you know, various response options. Again, here on the bottom, you see the, the various audience segments, the, the six Americas. And um, what they distinguish here are six, five, five answers. Global warming isn't happening. Humans can't reduce global warming even if it is happening. Uh, humans could reduce it, but it's uh, not clear whether they're willing to change. Um, and then the, the third one is humans could reduce global warming, but it's unclear um, whether we will do what's needed. And the last one uh, is humans can reduce global warming and we're going to do so successfully. I sort of think of the last one as the, you know, diehard optimists. Um, the ones on the top there, global warming isn't happening. Um, that's the group that doesn't even think there is a problem, so why bother? But the ones in the middle, that to me is the interesting segment. So you have humans can't reduce it. To me, that feels fatalistic. Um, you know, it's people who just don't think there's anything to do. Um, we could do it, but not sure um, humans are willing, sort of, you know, almost cynical. The third one is, is more of a skeptical one, you know? I think we could if we really put our, our, uh, our hands and, and minds to it, but whether or not we will, we have to yet see. So that segment, if you think about it, look for that segment in each of the six Americas. And what you find is that 90%, 92%, 89%, 92% of the most concerned are also most in that bracket of either fatalistic, cynical, or skeptical, whether we will. That's huge. That's a huge combination between, you know, in particular, the greatest numbers on the side of where you have the greatest worry. So the greatest worry and the greatest skepticism coincide in this. There is one other graphic from uh, those studies I want to show, and that is where um, Tony and, and Ed actually asked the question, you know, how do you feel about it? And interestingly enough, um, there are people who say, yes, we are helpless, um, sad, afraid, depressed about it. Um, not huge numbers in this one. Um, there's also, as you can see here, one, uh, one line that speaks directly, are you hopeful? So there's almost a, a toss up between the people who, you know, actually have the experience of being hopeful, um, maybe two out of 10, uh, two, two out of five, sorry, um, and, and 
those who feel helpless or you know maybe a, a smaller amount who are depressed about it. But it's an interesting finding, and I think it'd be worth the con conversation. What's the difference between you know these numbers that I just showed you before and those when people um, are explicitly asked about their emotions? My suspicion is that much of this hopelessness actually happens uh, at a not quite conscious level, except when people experience it. And we have these kinds of experiences, not just from my little anecdotes of people coming to me increasingly in my, in my trainings um, saying, you know, first we wanted to know how to communicate the science, then we wanted to know how to deal with the skeptics, now we want to know how to deal with hopelessness. This is literally in my surveys that I do when I ask people, you know, what do you want out of this training? This is how the sequence has gone. So that's an anecdotal, if you will, piece of evidence. But we have now qualitative studies from all over the world. I recently reviewed that, about 75 studies uh, in a paper in Wires Climate Change. And the sense of hopelessness that comes out of these qualitative studies is tangible and, and very real uh, in these. And I just showed three examples here from, this is from Australia, where suicide rates by f of farmers uh, was considerably higher. I show you a picture of Louisiana um, that is sinking into the ocean, where lots of people are losing their ancestral homes. And this is, of course, true in the Arctic. Um, and there are studies from all over the world. It is actually more a matter of where there are researchers studying this than about you know, where exactly it is. It is literally in these 75 studies I reviewed. Um, it, that's all over. And in fact, the people who were uh, most hopeless in some ways, uh, interviewed by Tony's students uh, at the climate march in New York, um, you know, when they were asked sort of to, what do you think about this? Uh, they, their first responses were, well, it's catastrophe. In a nutshell, that's basically at the end of the world as we know it. So there is something that is that is, you know, happening in people that may not be fully captured in the survey questions or in uh, when you ask, uh, you know, people consciously about it, and it is very much there. So then, let me ask the question and turn to this: What do we actually mean by hope? And I have to say, um, having recently, after you know, having encountered um, what people always ask me, like, how do we keep up hope? I went to the literature, and I find the scholarship pretty thin. It's not that there's not something there. I was quite thrilled that, for example, in psychology, there's something called hope theory. My goodness, who would have thunk? Um, so, but this is kind of what the psychologists say about it. It's an attitude. It's a way to maintain motivation. It's a skill. It's a mechanism. It's an attribute. It's a force. Interesting that we can't apparently agree. It's, you know, it's not just a feeling or something. It's, it's quite a, a cognitive and, and skill-based sort of notion of it. Um, Health and, and medical psychology in particular has uh, studied this quite a bit and people have literally found that um, when you have hope, it makes a difference to how well you heal, how healthy you are, how um, your sense of well-being. So very strongly a subjective factor in, in helping uh, maintain your, your well-being. Uh, who would have thunk, but economics thinks about it too. And they think of it as a re result. It's a result of empowerment. And then you go into the humanities, and actually I find those the most interesting. Um, the philosophers think of it as a meta-narrative, as a story that promises a better future. Um, people who are in religious studies think of it as a, either prerequisite or a byproduct of spiritual attainment. And in Greek mythology, I think that's the most interesting one. Um, it's an extension of suffering. Really interesting to think about that one. Anyway, so I find this a helpful start, and you will see this again later. I find it a little weak. So more recently, I've come across something that I think gets closer to what I think um, is sort of what we need to think about. And uh, this gentleman, Per Espen Stokness, um, I think is a Swedish um, uh, uh, gentleman, he came up with four varieties of hope. And the first one that he sort of described is what he's called passive optimism, or Pollyanna hope. Basically, people who think, ah, it's going to be fine, don't worry about it, that kind of flavor, okay? Then there are the people who are more actively optimistic, and he called them the, uh, called this the heroic hope. People who say, 
you know, it's going to be okay, but we're going to work hard and we're going to put all our weight behind it. So people who at least think they need to do something about this to get there. And then he goes into an interesting um, variation on the theme. You know, much of what I showed you earlier in the, sci uh, in the scientific uh, literature was sort of outcome oriented. And what he describes here now is people who are actually quite skeptical about good outcome. But in this case here, um, passive skepticism, as he calls it, or stoic hope, um, people who might think, you know, it's going to get bad, but we're going to make it through. That, do, you, do you all know these people? I, yeah, I, I think he's pretty much onto something. Of course, the last one is, um, this is not hard to imagine, so there's also active uh, skepticism, what he called grounded hope, and that is people who say, you know, there is absolutely no guarantee of outcome, and I'm going to do my darnest to make this as good an outcome as we can make it. So people who are fully facing the realities that we're in and still work every day, um, and that gets them out of the bed. Not the outcome, but basically the motivation to do their best, to be their best in the face of this. So hope in a dark time in my mind then is not just sort of this wishful thinking the, the, or a way to keep just our good spirits up, you know, or to, to find quick and easy solution. But I think the moment that we're in, and I personally I think this is the most hopeful thing about having a discourse on hope, is that the fact that we're asking that is a matter of there is a yearning that's that's growing in society. There is, in, the, in this sort of cultural moment that I described in the beginning, there is this moment now of inquiry. We ask for hope. We look for what can we do, how can we conduct ourselves uh, in the face of grave danger. So it's really much more grounded, and, and that is probably the only hope that will get us through. But now think back to my opening picture of this, um, the, the bridge that you saw there, the longest teak bridge in the world, who would have known in Myanmar, Dubain. Um, it has no railing. This is not easy work. This is hard work. So sorry to come, you know, about hope with a, I don't know, difficult message or something, but it's really hard work to be hopeful in this sense. So how do we do this? I think it starts here for all of us to actually face that truth. And my God, that is not easy. For I can say for myself, it's taken me years. I've worked on climate change since I went to graduate school. Um, and it is just so difficult to let in what I'm learning. Not, you know, from here to let it sink a little bit lower. I think Bill McKibben had a great way of putting it. Um, he said, we have to do something much braver than try to save the world we have known. We must accept the fact that the world we have known is going to change in hideous and damaging ways. Or you've probably uh, heard Terry Tempest Williams speak about this. Um, she basically you know, acknowledges, I cry every day about this, not because I'm sad, but because I feel it. She lets it in. She lets it in at the, at the gut level, not just the brain level. And I think in many ways that's our most important task at this moment in time, to not avert our gaze, to not allow ourselves to go numb to the world. I think being numb is another form of suicide. I think this is a really tall charge. It means that we all have to do our own emotional work on this. I mean, many of you are familiar with Joanna Macy's work. She's been calling for despair work for a long time. Um, the whole notion behind it is that, you know, we have to not be isolated in it, we have to actually allow that, and it will free much energy for the work that is needed when we do actually go to all the dark feelings we might have about, be it climate change, biodiversity loss, or whatever you work, might work on. And what that means is that somehow, through this ongoing and repeated emotional work, we will accept what is going on, but not collapse. That's sort of the, this fine balance that we're looking for. And I think it starts with allowing our own hopelessness. I don't know how many of you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you have allowed yourself to feel the despair of whatever you work on? It is not easy to do. Um, grief, fear for your children, for yourself, for the places you love, all that comes up. Um, and then at the same time, we have to sort of hold the fact that, you know, that is true. And it's a gorgeous day. I live in, in Santa Cruz. I look out over Monterey Bay. It's like 
it's just mind-blowing beautiful how do you do these things at the same time i think being able to hold that paradox between it's not all bad it's not all good it's not you know over it's we have no other place to go but there is you know we have both of these realities going on at the same time i think is really a challenging thing and it's taken me years to do that so i think it is out of that going back and forth between these paradoxes. In, in depth psychology, people actually say that if you can hold two completely irreconcilable opposites, something new emerges out of that. And for me, what's come out of that, I think, is the notion of futures, plural. I think this is the essence of, or a prerequisite, I should say, of hope, that you need to be not convinced. <laughs> it's going to be fine, or it's going to be all awful. If you're certain that you're in one end of the other, why bother? You don't need hope. It's when you accept the uncertainty and the possibilities of we don't know that you can have hope that actually can take you somewhere. So this is my latest thing. You know, when people always say, oh my god, we need to get rid of uncertainty, I'm thinking, no, this is great. We need uncertainty. Otherwise, there would be no room for hope. So I want to actually invite you for a moment. Um, not just have me talk at you, but for a moment then to think about in the face of those possibilities, in the face of great danger and uncertainties, I want you to think just for a moment for yourself who you want to be in that context. that call you you don't know how it's going to turn out who do you want to bring forth then what is your highest self what is your vision for yourself? Who is called to answer this call? How much of your day do you spend doing that, being that? alone? Do you need support? What can you anchor in that will get you through a disaster, through a loss? challenge you to go into your next talk, into your next work, into your, into this conference, into whatever you do today and in your work to truly speak from that place. So I want to wrap this up by talking about how we then help others find that place in themselves. Originally my first uh, line here was that it's the most important message, <laughs> because aren't we communicators, we need to have a message. Well, I think that I'm getting more and more away from thinking we need a message, but I think a communicator in this context is a supporter, a helper. And I wanna say that the most important thing you will ever say to anyone is just you. Whatever, just don't say anything, just show up. Who you are is what you're going to do and bring out in others. If you're real, if you're grounded, if you're solid in your emotional work with this, if you have sort of grown the strength, the maturity to, to hold those paradoxical truths, 
And if you're inspired from that deep place that we just sort of touched on just for a moment, then I think you can be all those things for other people and you can bring that out to others, in others. So to inspire others, you gotta be inspired yourself. If you're bored and you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, I think it's very, very difficult to get that across. So forget whatever message you have, just show up in that way and you are golden. The way I use this or, or put this in my trainings is to say, come as a friendly communicator. What that means is you don't just fall in with the latest science and the statistics on everything. Instead, you come as if you were the audience's friend. And what that means is you come as a human being, right? How are you? Make a connection. Just you know, connect with people around whatever their loves, their you know, inspirations, their aspirations for themselves are their values, their interests. You acknowledge, before you say the bad news, you acknowledge that you come with tough news because people brace themselves and are actually more able to hear it when you do that. And then you actually try to tap that into, not just barrage them with this information, but you come and you help them be curious about it. And uncertainty in that context, I think, again, is a way in which you can do that. And then this truth telling that you yourself have to bear, right? The, the truth bearing that we talked about earlier, there's a, a moment for that in, in that for whatever you have to say to others. But I think it's in the sense that David Orr suggests. Telling the truth means that the people must be summoned to a level of extraordinary greatness appropriate to an extraordinarily dangerous time. I love that. It's not just you know killing people with your bad news. It's bringing out in them the best, right? You want to bring them up to, to live from that deepest place. So summoning people to a higher vision. And because of what you will have to say to them, they too will have, just like you, emotions about that, strong emotions, anything. So how do you create that safe space for it? Well, there is no way to do that on command. Um, putting people on the spot, putting a microphone into their face. It's an invitation and people need to have choice. Public spaces are practically taboo um, for you know, having, having feelings in this culture. Maybe there are some others where that's not as uh, strongly tabooized, but certainly here it is. Um, validating that what they, in, in an authentic way, you know, not like this sweet talking stuff that makes people just feel like, ugh. What did I just do? That was not a good move to show any emotion. But truly coming from a very real place to validate that we all have these emotions, normalizing that, everyone has them. Being present to that, to, to whatever they express, witness it, not try to fix it. I think it's one of the worst experiences I've ever had when someone, you know, I have a, an ex have a feeling and someone tries to tap me on the shoulder and, and whatever, shut me up that way. Ooh, don't do that. <laughs> but respecting it, truly respecting where people are at. And they might be in a numb place, they might be in a you know, Pollyanna hope place, they might be in you know, a despair place. So simply respecting it, helping people understand that all emotions are connected and will move. And that means that you yourself need to grow your own capacity to be with people in distress. You know, whether you work with people who literally have just gone through a sandy or a drought or a flood or whatever, um, you need to be willing to bear and be that witness. And I think that is something we grow over time and I think we have to grow that muscle a lot stronger given what's coming. But I think what's important is that, you know, if, it's, if it stays there, if you're just in that place of, you know, whatever the emotions are, and you don't help people come to a place of, you know, a better future, dignified future, um, something that they can hope for, I think it's incredibly difficult. So helping people understand and frame where they're at, that we're in a, we're in a transition, we're in a, you know, the beginning stages of a deep transformation. And I think it's important that you understand and maybe uh, look a little bit into the sort of typical um, patterns of a transition. They all have an ending, that they begin with an ending. That's the hard part. And people are defensive of those, that people want to hold on to what they have at all cost. There is a time when maybe they're in a sort of, you know, they don't know yet what the new thing is. They have to move to something different. And then there is a new beginning. 
and in, in and of itself that is uh, a hope. So this is just you know one of the many ways in which this has been depicted. Other people have written about this. But I think what you're seeing here is a deep transformative change um, depicted with all kinds of emotions. And I think it's a lot easier to help people through that when you are familiar by having gone through it yourself. So what is that vision? Um, I am not in the business of telling you what that vision for you is. Probably you have all kinds of uh, notions. But what I often do in my, uh, in my work is that I use this amazing poem um, by Wendell Berry called A Vision. It's in his selected poems and published in 1998. And it begins with these words. If we have the wisdom to survive, to survive, to stand like slow-growing trees on a ruined place, renewing and enriching it. My God, there is like in these three lines, and it goes on like this for you know a good uh, good length, and it ends with this. This is not a paradisal dream. Its hardship is its possibility. I think people are really um, when you take them through this, and if you don't sort of end on a note of this is hard work to do it, I think then it becomes just fluff that goes away the minute, you know, it's just sugar water. By the end of it, people will just go home and, well, that was nice, but, you know, they might actually sink into deeper despair because they don't know how to get there. So how then do you foster that authentic hope? And I think this is going to be the most radical thing you will ever do as communicators, to not make the despair, if you will, convincing, but to make hope possible. Um, and I've taken uh, Raymond Williams uh, seriously on that one and have actually used in many ways the methods and approaches that have been put forward by psychology but added to that from a lot of the more humanistic and, um, and uh, well, sort of non-mainstream uh, practitioner uh, literature. So let me take you very quickly through these steps and I think this is something that I've given this recipe to anything from elected officials to people who work in an NGO and um, it seems to really deeply resonate. And that is that every, to get to authentic hope, to real grounded hope, um, you need to actually start from a place of where we're really at. You know, if a doctor told you um, or avoided telling you that maybe that you have a serious illness, you wouldn't know, like, where, where, is the, where are we starting from, right? You need to be realistic about that. You need to help people see where that is. But you can't just stay there. There needs to be a worthwhile outcome. Often, you know, I, like I said, I engage people in helping to vision that, what that is for them. You know, the doctor might say, okay, so you have cancer, you can be well again, or you can die without pain, right? It's, it, it doesn't have to end in some glorious sort of, you know, it's all going to be hunky-dory. The point is to have a realistic outcome uh, pointed for that is worthwhile to the audience that you're speaking with. And then how do we get there? The notion of a path. How do we get there? Um, what are the things that need to be done? What do, we ha what do we do when there are setbacks? Because they inevitably will happen. There will be many, many climate disasters. Many species will get lost before anything gets better. What do we do in those instances? You know, if a patient doesn't know what you do when the, whatever, the chemo doesn't work, what's the next step? It's really, they will just, you know, then give up at that moment when something goes wrong. What can I do? What is a meaningful contribution on that path to getting along that? Um, and I think this is where I deviate from sort of mainstream cognitive psychology is where you add something that taps into that deepest, deepest calling, whatever, you know, the thing we just, just touched on uh, very lightly in, in previously. So what is that highest self that people can bring out of themselves to bring to that task? And last but not least is that a sense that we're doing this together. If people don't understand what you will do, you know, then, gosh, I'm going to be alone in this? Too hard to bear. Doing that together is a whole other proposition. I will be there. I will accompany you from here to wherever we can go. So very important to doing that together. So in closing, then, what is it that we can hope for? Um, I think I don't want to answer that because I don't know where you are on the spectrum of the varieties of hope that are out there. Um, and in your 
various instances or, or topics and, and areas wherever you live, uh, you might have different answers. But I think what's important is that we don't need to have all the answers before we can start and get people engaged. What I keep finding is that the people who are actually most actively engaged, they actually do something, they're the most hopeful people. Not because they have it all figured out, but because they somehow know something about the social change it takes to make there. They're engaged in it. And so what I love here, and I want to um, end on this note. Um, Rudolf Barrow is a German activist and, and thinker, and he once said, you know, when an old culture is dying, the new culture is born from a few people who are not afraid to be insecure. So get on that, you know, on that bridge. However wobbly it is, even if you don't see all the way where it's going at the end, um, the place to start is just getting on it, being willing to be insecure. And as March Piercy in her amazing poem, The Little Road, says at the end, it starts when you say we and know who you mean, people in the room, your neighbors, your colleagues, your, your friends, your family. You know who you mean, and each day you mean one more. So starting with insecurity, starting or from the place of we and be willing to go there, I think that is that bridge without railing that I'm talking about. Thank you.